um, to the webinar, and um, we are going to be talking about how you can support victims and survivors of that are faith-based. Um, today, I this is Allison Morse Katzman. As uh, Maria said, I'm the associate director at Safe Havens, and with me is hi, I'm Shireen Akrambosar, project coordinator at Safe Havens. So. Thank you again. Before we get started, um, we'd really like to know who you all are. So the um, right now we have a poll. Who's on this call? Are you an advocate, a first responder? So the poll is open, and if you would kindly click what you are, and if you're other, maybe you, I think you might be able to um, type in um, in the chat box what you are, although I'm not sure. Maria can pop in and correct me if I'm wrong. So if you could please do that, that would be really helpful. And I guess. So we have about 11% um, chiming in that they're other. Don't forget to type in the question box what your other is. And what about the others? 11% other, how many so advocates? As of, yeah, as of right now, we have 90% advocates, 10% um, other. Now we have 14% other. Um, again, don't forget to type those in the chat question box, what your, um, who, who you are, who, who's on the call. All right, we'll give it another couple seconds and then we'll move to the next poll question. Um, so we'd also like to know what you're seeing um, in your communities. Have you actually worked with faith-based victims? Um, have you worked with a faith-based organization? And what kinds of relationships do you have with clergy and faith communities? And if you can just, if you would type it in to say, you can say good or solid or not, not existent, um, that would be really helpful. And we'll take a few minutes for that. Actually, not a few minutes, just about a minute. Perfect. So, so far we have about 60% of folks who have worked with faith-based victims. 31% have uh, worked with faith-based organizations. 32% haven't worked with either. Um, and um, just for, from the previous question, we have someone joining us from a coalition, which is exciting. Oh, that's awesome. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Maria. All right, well, so we'll get started um, so that we can move things forward. And hopefully, um, you'll keep the, the you'll, you'll keep in mind the work that you have done with victims or, or faith communities as we go through. So there is a lot of abuse happening in our communities and many of those victims of abuse are also faithful people. Um, partnering with faith communities and faith leaders can be one aspect of the community education and training that you might already be doing or maybe that you wanna do. And that's what we're here to talk about today. We wanna to look at opportunities uh, for outreach and partnership building and to introduce some resources that may help you. Um, I think though that the real key here is working together. You have very obviously very specific expertise in working with victims of sexual violence um, and, and maybe domestic violence as well, but faith leaders also have very specialized expertise and we're help, here to help you figure out what their expertise might look like and how it, you can help how you can leverage it and help the faith communities to be um, better at responding effectively, confidentially, and safely. Um, we, at the end, we hope you'll have a better understanding of the importance of faith in the lives of some of the faith-affiliated victims and a new appreciation for how to work with faith communities um, that will ultimately increase access to your services and help survivors. So, what is Safe Haven? We are a multi-religious organization. I think that's really important to remember. We don't work with just one faith kind of faith community. We work with as many kinds of faith communities as we can. Um, and we dream and work, dream of and work toward a world in which faith leaders, all faith leaders, can respond compassionately and effectively to survivors of domestic violence and sexual violence and elder abuse. Um, 
we, as I said, we work with diverse faith communities. We are located in the Boston area, and we our local work is, is pretty much across the state of Massachusetts, but we also have OPW funding, Office on Violence Against Women funding, to do um, national work in the areas of domestic violence, sexual violence, and elder abuse. Um, through that work with the Office on Violence Against Women, we've had um, several different grants, and through those grants, we have developed resources that are specific to different communities. Um, I don't know how many of you are set in rural areas, but we do have a very, um, a, a really great, I say it's really great, but we've heard from other people that say it's great as well, a toolkit um, on how to reach out to um, faith communities in rural settings. And the, the toolkit, in all of our toolkits, we have components that are for advocates um, and that help the advocates think about how you might want to do outreach to faith communities. And then we have specific resources that are geared for faith leaders. If you're a faith leader, you're probably not going to be having a whole lot of time to spend reading resources. And when we were doing our research on all of these, we would get try and gather re resources from other places. And some of the resources that we got were so thick, we wouldn't even look at them. Um, so these are very thin um, and easy for faith leaders to read. So you can go online to our rural page to check out the rural resources. We also have worked um, with the National Clearinghouse on Abuse in Later Life and developed um, elder abuse and faith resources. Um, they are also a really great resource and we have a new training curriculum that actually has just been approved by the office on violence against women and we're hoping we'll be taking that um, show on the road soon we have lastly our newest resources are really truly hot off the presses they're not even on our website yet but they will be soon and these are resources that are for um victims of domestic and sexual violence um but for faith leaders, and they're more for um, our first set of first toolkit was for rural communities. This um, set of resources was adapted from that, but for a more general audience, you don't need to be from a rural community. It doesn't address the specific that um, rural communities experience, um, and that includes all of um, those include training curriculums. And again, this will be online soon. All right, so we want to begin by exploring why knowing more about faith and about how faith can affect victims would be important to your work. Many Americans are faith-based. Uh, while uh, the numbers are declining with time, that's uh, more than 60% of Americans in every age group identify as faith-affiliated. And for older adults, the number uh, rockets up to almost 90%. Uh, the U.S. is also very religiously diverse. This means that there are many traditions that a client could be a member of and many beliefs and cultural norms that could affect a client. Also, let me know if you can't hear me as well as uh, you could hear Alice. Um, so underserved communities need and deserve special attention. Many of these underserved communities are also places where faith uh, is particularly vibrant and central. In many of these communities, the faith community and the faith leader are deeply trusted. The faith community may be the main source of services and aid, providing a lifeline for many who come under its wing. And we know that there are many barriers to safety that a client may encounter. Uh, as advocates, you're familiar with all of these. Uh, many of them are tied to or even inextric inextricable from the victim's faith. We also know that many victims who are faith affiliated may turn to someone in their faith community for help. Uh, this could be the faith leader, but it could also be someone in the choir, in a scripture study class, or even the administrative assistant on Tuesday morning, for example. Anyone in a faith community, like anyone in the wider community, could be a first responder. The Georgia Domestic Violence Fatality Review Team began raising awareness about the importance of faith in 2009 after they saw how frequently victims in their study group had turned to faith leaders or faith communities for support, as these quotes here demonstrate.
Uh, there's very little research on victims in minority communities, but one study of older adults discovered that older women frequently named a faith leader when asked where they would turn for help if faced abuse. So the older the victim, the more likely they were to name a specific faith leader or congregation when asked where to turn, they would turn for help. So for faith-affiliated clients, there's a direct linkage between faith and, and concepts like marriage, intimate relationships, dating, and gender roles. Uh, this was a study of older adults, but even many younger people fall back on the understandings of their family's faith tradition or cultural norms when they think about these concepts, whether they're not uh, actually faith-affiliated themselves. For all these reasons, faith communities and faith leaders are a really great opportunity to get information out into the community and to connect with victims of abuse. Oh, so you've heard realtors will say location, 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 um, but it really does apply here. If you are a um, trusted member of a faith community or a leader, you might be perfectly located to be a listening ear or to see what's happening in the lives of your, your congregants or the fellow congregants, um, also to recognize red flags and, and to help be a bridge to community resources and services. Um, so faith leaders teach and they have many opportunities to influence the community's understanding of what healthy relationships um, and can look like and what abuse is, sexual and domestic when faith is misinterpreted or misapplied to uh, support abuse of any kind, faith leaders can actually be a great um, response, a responsive um, ear. Faith leaders also can stay alert for signs of abuse and provide resources early on. And faith communities as a whole represent an invaluable opportunity to reach faith-affiliated people and the wider community with information about abuse, available services, and life-saving support and safety. Before I go on, I want to mention that we, Safe Havens um, talks about faith leaders, but we don't just mean clergy, because we look at anyone in a faith community being a first responder or being a leader. Anyone who takes an interest in, in, in their own community mm -hmm. can be that person that someone, that a victim or anyone turns to for help. So keep that in mind. We're not just talking about the priest or the rabbi or the imam. We're talking about anyone. It might be someone in the pews. It might be, um, you know, the choir director. It might be someone that you take a, you know, go to a, a brown bag lunch with. So, like I said, please keep that in mind. Um, many faith-affiliated clients look for guidance from their faith leaders, and so faith community leadership on this issue can really be effective. But at the same time, victims of abuse who don't hear anything from their faith community um, and all they hear is silence about abuse are receiving a very, very powerful message. Working with your faith community is a great opportunity to expand access to the services your agency um, provides. I would highly recommend it. Everyone is always looking to expand their services and to get to more people who need their help. And by collaborating and partnering with faith communities, this is a really um, great way to do that. We've heard from many advocates, um, and we have worked with a lot of different advocates across the country. Um, between our grants, Safe Havens has probably visited 20, at least 25 sites across the United States, working with um, OVW-funded uh, grantees, and, and they're all advocates. So we under, we've heard from them that they have been able to leverage their faith community work to include the whole community. And um, even just working with one faith community can, can brought, open up the doors to working with other faith communities. Um, we wanted to stop here. Before we move on to the next section, we want to see if there are any questions on what we've covered so far. Feel free to type in the chat box uh, if you have a question. Um, and if you think of a question in a little bit, also feel to feel free to type it in the chat box and we'll 
um, address them uh, later. Hey, so there are a couple of questions that came in. Um, the first one is, is it normal to deny the situation? Um, and so I'll ask the next one after that. When you say normal to deny the situation for the faith leader to deny the situation or for the um, a, um, victim or survivor to deny the situation? Because that would be the case in both situations, I think. Yeah, so I'm waiting for that person to go ahead and type in that clarification for us. Great. You want to go to the next question and then we'll go back to the other one? Yeah. Um, and aren't, aren't some women forced into marriage is the next question. Um, well, I think that we all know stories of different faith communities who have arranged marriages. Um, and I can't really speak to what faith communities they are because I think it happens in many different faith communities. I know that mm -hmm. um, in the Jewish faith community, in the Jewish community, in some ultra Orthodox parts of the community, maybe there are um, arranged marriages where the um, woman, because it's always the woman who really has less of a choice um, in this case, maybe she is not happy and feels forced, um, but they're all, I can only speak to that community personally, um, but I think that that would be the case in, in across the world and not just in the United States. I think um, there are some more fundamental communities where that possibly could be happening. Mm -hmm. um, I think with both these questions, uh, both things do happen, the faith leader, might deny that abuse is happening. Um, it might seem difficult to sort of break through into this uh, community, but that doesn't mean that as advocates, we shouldn't be working with these communities and sort of uh, finding ways to find common ground, even if there are lots of challenges. And, and for faith leaders who might deny that abuse is happening, it might just be because they don't understand abuse. Uh, I mean, I would say, I would venture to guess. I'm, I shouldn't say that. I'm not venturing to guess at all. But I know we Safe Havens has done some work in the Massachusetts area where we interviewed a number of different faith leaders, and every single one of them, to a T, said that physical mm -hmm. abuse was not acceptable. That 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 was not acceptable, and that but they hadn't ever seen anyone. No one had come to them and said, "I've been physically abused." What they didn't understand was the um they didn't understand the how other types of abuse. the other types of abuse and how whether it's sexual violence or or um financial abuse or emotional abuse or any of those how those factored in uh and and once they do understand then I, m most of the clergy that we have worked with mm -hmm. totally uh, understand that that's not that it's not acceptable and they they have a new understanding of how victims and survivors are affected. Now, there are always going to be, just like in every um, issue that we work on, there are always going to be people who are don't agree and who don't understand, and then we just suggest that you don't continue to work with those groups. Any other questions? Yeah, there was another one that came in that asked, how do you address atheists, etc.? Um, well, we're, atheism is not really, uh, that they deny that there's um, a God, but at the same time, they, you might, they might be culturally um, connected to a faith community that they grew up with. And they may still, just like we said earlier, when um, people during life, um, oh, life changing events or, or life cycle events, people often fall back on the faith that they grew up with, even if they're not currently affiliated. It may be that an atheist um, still falls back on that. Maybe they still have a Christmas dinner, or they might have attend a Passover Seder, or or go to um, an event after, you know, during Ramadan, but they don't really believe, they may still fall on those. Um, uh, or, yeah, or even their understanding of gender roles could have been influenced by that, um, even if they're not, uh, even if they're on, not conscious. 
but as we know also abuse happens in every community whether or not they're no matter how uh, faith affiliated they are or not and i think that's important to realize we know that not everyone not every victim is faith affiliated but we want um advocates and and people who work with victims of domestic and sexual violence and elder abuse to understand that this is this could be one aspect and and you, we wouldn't be culturally relevant um or responsive if we weren't asking what um the, the different their support that victims might um seek in their as they're trying to move towards a better life i want to just share one quick story um where we were in a, a community. Um, this was when we first started doing this work and we were just beginning to develop the resources and we spoke with um, an advocate and she said, oh, I'm so glad you're here. Every faith, um, every victim that we talk to comes in and talks about their faith. And we said, oh my gosh, that's wonderful. What do you do? How do you respond? She said, oh, I'm not interested in faith. And so I don't really, you know, address that. And that's a huge missed opportunity for advocates. Um, and we, we don't, that's why we're doing this. We don't want you to miss that opportunity because they just like a support group. Uh, there are lots of different ways um, victims and survivors seek um, support and that may be one of them. So we'll move on. Well, we wanna ask you a question next. Um, uh, can you think of a faith leader near you who you might reach out to? Uh, in light of the discussion that we've just done. And we'll come back to this. Or I should say, you'll come back to this. <laughs> have, can you? Uh, no, I can't tell. Oh, okay. Yeah, so, so far what we have is 70% say yes, 30% say no, and the votes are still coming in. All right, let's keep going. Oh, sorry. Uh, so faith community partnerships can be important to increase access to your services, expand community engagement, uh, respond to the needs of faith affiliated victims, and provide services that respond to a broad spectrum of victim needs. Faith can be critical to individual clients that you may have. Uh, in fact, many Americans turn to their faith for guidance, meaning, and invaluable community connections. Your client's faith may be critical to how they see the world, understand their own identity, make decisions, and find healing and wholeness. We also know that abuse itself can have a spiritual component. Victims can suffer spiritually as well as physically, financially, and emotionally. This kind of abuse can have many facets and nuances to, to it. Uh, for any faith or faith community, there are ways in which a victim may perceive her faith as support when experiencing abuse, and other ways in which a victim may feel that her faith is a barrier to safety. It's important to recognize that no one's experience with faith is entirely helpful or unhelpful. It's a nuanced uh, picture. So earlier we said that many Americans are faith affiliated. And for those, as we talked about, faith can be a source of strength, courage, and connection. Um, but turning to a faith leader may not always be helpful to a victim of sexual or domestic violence or elder abuse. Tenants of many faiths um, have been misinterpreted to support abuse. Victims sometimes sacrifice their own safety to protect the abuser, to keep the family together, to safeguard the honor of the family, or to uphold religious values such as forgiveness. And forgiveness is a real big one. Um, also, faith leaders have not received the training and resources about abuse. I mentioned that earlier. Um, and so as a result, faith leaders can be manipulated by abusers, just like victims can be. Um, and faith leaders sometimes misunderstand the seriousness of abuse. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. But all of this means that survivors who are faith affiliated may face specific kinds of barriers to their safety and may have access to specific kinds of resources as well. So let's first address the kinds of um, barriers that faith affiliated victims may face. Um, so 
As I said, many faith leaders have simply not received the training and resources and technical assistance they need to respond appropriately to victims of abuse. Now, just like we wouldn't dream of sending an untrained firefighter into a burning building, um, that's kind of how faith leaders feel when it comes to abuse. They don't feel they can wade in there because they don't know what they're talking about. Um, but we also have a theory at Safe Havens that um, kind of adds to this. We think that people don't use the graphic and ugly and profanity-laced language that describes what they've been through when they talk to their faith leaders. So if I were a victim talking to my faith leader, I would really tone it down. So advocates, you all may be hearing the real, true, terrible details, um, where is the faith leaders hearing a much watered down version? Mm -hmm. um, and so it's no wonder that the faith leader says, oh my gosh, that advocate's overreacting, and the advocate is saying, oh my gosh, doesn't that faith leader understand how truly dangerous the situation is? Faith leaders, and Safe Havens considers itself, uh, uh, you know, we're, we consider ourselves faith leaders, um, not advocates, um, but we work closely with advocates mm -hmm. because we believe in that partnering. But faith leaders have simply not learned how victims may minimize the abuse Advocates understand that. And if faith, leader, faith leaders don't know how victims minimize and they don't understand how hard it is to talk about the abuse and they don't understand how much courage it may take for a victim to disclose, then it's likely that um, not only are faith leaders not so supportive and effective, but they may not even be able to hear even mm -hmm. the slightest red flag. At the same time, victims may be interpreting the abuse through their lens, through the lens of their faith. If a faith leader doesn't know how faith and abuse can intersect, they may be unable to respond to these calls for help, and they may not be um, offering helpful interpretations of values and beliefs. Abuse is often silenced and shamed. Um, and it's denied within faith communities. In a nationwide study of African-American Christian congregations, the inability of either the congregation or the faith leader to acknowledge that the abuse happens in their own pews was reported as the number one barrier that kept victims of domestic violence from seeking help. I know I'm talking about specifically domestic violence here, um, but I think you can, um, you can, what's that word generalized. I'm saying, generalized here. So denial and silencing occur um, in all congregations and communities, not just in the African-American community. They were just the ones that did the study. So if faith leaders have not received the training and resources they need, abuse itself may be silenced or denied, as Allison was saying. Victims may be blamed or judged their disclosure may not be held in confidence. All too often, faith leaders have not known how to listen to the experience of victims, how to bear witness to the suffering that's happening in their own congregation. Even with the best of intentions, faith leaders have endangered and prolonged the harm uh, to victims of abuse. When faith leaders do respond, responses are sometimes re-traumatizing and unsafe for the victim. Faith leaders may suggest unsafe solutions or jump in with quick fix fixes. They may try to patch over the problem with couples or marriage counseling, which of course is further endangering the victim's safety. Since, uh, since we consider faith leaders first responders, uh, they need training and resources as well as the partnerships with local advocates. When faith leaders and faith communities do get training and resources about abuse, they can be a more effective resource for victims who are faith affiliated. In addition, faith communities and faith leaders can be allies in efforts to end abuse. As you all know, abuse uh, abusers often isolate their victims and uh, faith-based victims often find their faith to be kind of an antidote to that. As you see here, the, the root of the word religion means to connect or bind. Abuse 
isolates people, destroys relationships, and breaks the covenant of marriage and the bonds of family and community. For survivors who are faith-affiliated, religion, spirituality, or faith can provide a connection to community, family, history, and spiritual roots and healing. Abuse really takes so many things away. So for victims who are faith-affiliated, religion can be a resource that no one can take away. And faith can help a survivor grieve. Abuse can make the, the victim feel confused, disoriented, and like they're standing on shifting sand. Faith, on the other hand, uh, can help faith-affiliated victims orient themselves in space and time with their religious holidays over the course of the year, daily prayer, and other traditions that can provide grounding. So you may have clients who are strongly faith-affiliated. Uh, for them, the approval of a faith leader is critical when moving forward with a decision or an, a new action. This means that clergy have a tremendous ability to influence a situation or a de decision-making process. So, as I said earlier, or Shireen said earlier, that not all victims are faith-affiliated. And then when we were, someone was asking about the atheist um, victims, but it doesn't matter whether you're faith affiliated or not. Everyone needs to be heard um, and needs for someone to bear witness and, and accompany them on the journey to justice and safety. Um, the work you do is critically important as you come accompany your clients on this journey. And um, I would introduce to you our, the, this book. You should, I would suggest that you look it up, Walking Together, A Guide for Domestic Violence Advocates. It talks about um, working with uh, people of all different spiritual traditions and, and what those, they may be cultural traditions, they may be faith-based traditions, um, but it's a great uh, resource for your um, bookshelf. So, guidelines for responding. I We put these in here because a lot of times we hear from advocates uh, that they're afraid to work with faith-based clients. They don't understand where the line is. Maybe they get federal funding, so they think they can't talk about faith, um, or maybe they're uncomfortable with their own faith. We don't expect any advocate to be um, an expert on faith at all. Uh, maybe you do have your own faith, but you should be keeping that to yourself when you're talking to victims anyway, mm -hmm. because you're all victim-centered and, and it's about the victim. Um, so we, we came up with some of these guidelines for responding to faith-based victims, and, and they go with whether they're faith-based or not. Um, and you can see them here, but we welcome all clients, regardless of whether they're faithful. Um, we don't want to establish any faith as normative, so I would, if you have a bunch of Christian um, resources, I would suggest adding some resources from other faiths on your on your bookshelves or in your waiting room. Um, avoid assumption about faith affiliation. You know, you can get into a lot of trouble just like you can get into a lot of trouble about making any assumptions anywhere. Um, listen, uh, that advocate that I mentioned earlier, um, if faith is important to your client, then ask questions about that. What, what are, Ask how faith is important. Ask how it either is a hindrance to her or or a resource. You can ask the questions. You don't have to be an expert here. Um, you don't even have to have all the answers. You can just listen, which is what I know you all do so well. <laughs> so here we would like to know um, some of hear from you about your insights. And if you could type in the chat, I know it will be recorded. We may not get to all of them, but What's one way you've seen faith act as a barrier for victims? And what's one way you've seen faith act as a resource for victims? If you could take a minute to type um, in a couple of answers, that would be really helpful for us. So as those come in, um, someone asked for you to repeat the name of the book that you mentioned um, that you had recommended. Yes, I'd be happy to. It's, um, I gotta make sure I say it correctly. Um, it's by Jean Anton, A-N-T-O-N. 
and it's called Walking Together, a Guide for Domestic Violence Advocates. Anything coming in for uh, barrier and resource, Maria? Yeah, so um, they're still coming in. So one of the things is a support system. Um, a barrier is that uh, my clients of faith have often not wanted to leave an abusive spouse to, due to the stigma surrounding divorce in many faith communities. And that stigma encourages them to stay in unsafe situations. Mm -hmm. um, another barrier that came in, clergy minimizes abuse or tells survivor to pray or to go to marriage counseling or other victim blaming statements if it's a sexual assault. Um, for example, were you drinking, et cetera. Um, let's see, when faith communities do not believe survivors, it can make life really difficult. Another barrier, client doesn't want to leave the abuser because their faith promotes the family staying together. Um, a resource that came in was faith communities offer a support system that many of my clients rely on heavily. Um, I've had clients um, who told me their faith leader told them they should not have they should not leave their abuser. A whole bunch are coming in. It's been a barrier when faith leaders are delivering messages to the victim for a perpetrator who has a restraining order against him or her. It's also a barrier. Oh. Yeah, also a barrier when faith, community, family sides with the perpetrator. Um, some victims are very reluctant to leave their abusers if it involves breaking up the family. Divorce, like the other person said, is stigmatized in some faith communities. Um, a barrier is that the DV victim will use her faith as justification for everything that happens in her life. My client believes it is all part of God's plans. She has even stated that if she dies due to the abuse, it will be God's will. Um, a couple of resources that are coming in, housing, resources for basic needs, support from other church members, faith in God as resource and healing, hope for the future. Another resource of the faith leader or community is supportive. It can um, increase survivor strength and support them in right. abusive situations. So, Thanks. yeah, there's there plenty more that are coming in. The things we could probably go well past mm -hmm. two o'clock just talking about this, but there is uh, there are a couple of things I do want to say. Um, we we at Safe Havens have experienced. We've heard. All, many of those things, probably all of them, um, from different um, victims and survivors that they uh, and advocates. Um, we never promote. As a matter of fact, we don't. It's not even a question of promoting. We tell every time we meet with faith leaders, we tell them as strenuously as we can that couples counseling is absolutely dangerous. Um, but I want to just point out that, like we said, if you don't under if you don't know how to fight a fire, you can't be blamed exactly for not putting that fire out. And faith leaders don't understand um, how best to support victims of sexual and domestic violence and elder abuse because they've never learned it in seminary or they've never had that. Most of them haven't had that training, and so if they don't know but they do know because they've learned about um, family counseling, then they're gonna be, that's what they're going to do. They're gonna do what they know how to do. And we tell them that that's not safe. We tell them that couples counseling at the best is a waste of time. At worst, it could be lethal. Mm -hmm. So once we, once they understand that, and, and certainly they don't have to hear it from us, they can hear it from, from advocates as well. Um, there's no question that faith leaders and advocates have the same interests I don't know of any faith, well, I have never met a faith leader that doesn't want everyone in his or her faith community to be safe. And almost every faith leader that we've talked to would agree that violence breaks the covenant of marriage, not the divorce. Um, and that's something that faith leaders have to un come to understand. I'm sure that there are lots of faith leaders out there that would take a while to make them understand that but that's because they don't understand the nature of domestic abuse. Um, once they do understand that, 
they usually come to a new understanding of mm -hmm. what's acceptable and what's not. Also, I want to, um, the, and Shireen, please chime in if there's any of those things that you want to add. Um, the idea that victims are staying in their relationship because of the, um, because of their faith, they don't, divorce is frowned upon. There's no question that that can happen. But just like there are non-faith affiliated victims who want to stay in the relationship, mm -hmm. um, there are, you know, it, it's the same thing. So working with um, the victims to be as safe as possible in that situation um, is something that we, we as advocates or you as advocates can think about. Um, yeah, yeah um, we understand how frustrating also it can be to see all the ways the, that the victims uh, or certain aspects of the victim's faith may be uh, keeping them from leaving uh, or, or seeking safety. But uh, that's also partly why remembering the ways that uh, faith is a resource to these victims is so important um, so that we can help them strategize and, and find ways to navigate the situation that is best for them. Um, they're usually they're not likely to be giving up uh, an aspect of their faith, especially during points of crisis. Do we want to see it? Uh, Maria, have, have there been, maybe we can take a couple of questions if, if any have come up or between the last time that we took? Yeah, we have one question that came in. Do you have any recommendations on how to effectively provide outreach to faith leaders and offer trainings in larger faith-based communities? Yes, as a matter of fact, we're gonna to get to that. So mm -hmm. we'll hold off on that and we can come back to that question if we haven't answered it through the slides coming up. Okay. Is that okay? That sounds perfect. Thank you. Okay. So, so what can, how can faith leaders, we don't want faith leaders to become experts on um, domestic abuse and sexual violence and elder abuse. We want them to understand, we want them to be able to, to recognize, respond, and refer. And so there are certain roles in doing that that faith leaders can take on. One is, um, through earlier intervention. Um, if faith leaders are able to break the silence in their congregation, and you all know that when, when all of a sudden um, someone starts talking about, or, or this has been our experience, a lot of times when a faith leader finally understands um, domestic or sexual violence and starts talking about it, victims are coming out of the woodwork. Um, and if the, the trained faith leaders can acknowledge the abuse and trauma, um, they may be able to help with safe, compassionate, and confidential listening, and then providing referrals to organizations such as yours. That's the second part. So if they can recognize, um, respond by listening, and then refer to your um, refer to your services, the victims are going to be way better off. Prevention is an obvious way that faith leaders can. Um, work with you all they can invite you to provide um, education to advocates you can um, ta do tabling they can incorporate information about intimate partner violence and premarital counseling sessions that's not something that's going to happen right away you have to realize that this is over a, a course of a while um, and then also faith leaders can really address long-term social change faith leaders see um, a lot of times faith leaders have families over generations and they have faith communities have preschool and they have Sunday school and they have confirmation. And so they're seeing young people at all different ages. This is a place for them to say that, you know, how do we have um, healthy relationships? How do we, re how do we work with people collaboratively and respectfully? These are all ways that faith leaders can, um, affect long-term social change. They can also challenge all the isms that we have in our society. And, um, and that's a long list right there. So just uh, kind of in summary, uh, faith leaders and faith community members bring a lot to the table. They can provide compassionate listening, acknowledgement of the abuse and spiritual and material support. Faith leaders can be a trusted guide to help people find safety, 
uh, vigilant and responsive faith leaders can also intervene earlier, as we've said, which means the trauma will be lessened and the likelihood that the victim and even the perpetrator can be successfully helped. So it's imperative that we work together to, to provide holistic care instead of essentially bifurcating the victim and their sources of support, which is what generally happens. Faith leaders and service providers won't definitely won't agree on everything, but uh, must find enough trust and common ground to respond to this issue. Often issues that cause disagreement can be framed in terms of how does this impact uh, victims and, and then moving from there. So these are some suggestions for the next slide. So um, identify commonalities and put those forward uh, from the start. You both have the victim's interest at heart. Um, figure out ways to increase face-to-face uh, -face interaction and then partnership get to know individual faith leaders and establish rapport so that you can refer to each other, uh, meaning making you can make referrals based on knowing and trusting each other when you need when you need to. Remember to include faith communities in your CCRs. Uh, we added the term, at Safe Havens, we added the term coherent to CCRs because currently victims are receiving vastly different messaging from their, their service providers, their faith leaders. We want to bridge this gap so victims receive consistent, uh, straightforward, and holistic uh, guidance options. And as always, focus on the victim's needs first and foremost. And, and as I said, when disagreement comes up, emphasize uh, this as your common ground. So don't assume any background or expertise on these issues among clergy and, and faith leaders. Break things down, describe your role carefully, uh, but also offer uh, this to be reciprocal and acknowledge how much you have to learn from them. You can suggest training your own staff on faith-based issues, for example. Uh, so this quote is testimony of how a victim's life can be transformed when they realize that they're not alone and that they can have uh, their their faith community can have their back. So. One thing that we have learned, and we've learned this actually from a clergy person, is that a one-time training is not enough. You know, you could go in and, and do a training for a couple hours on the DV 101, but the, the people that came to that training, maybe they move away or, or, you know, they have a new clergy person and they forget about doing domestic violence. We really think that this is, um, journey is really a marathon and going slow um, is not a bad thing at all. Developing, you don't develop relationships with people overnight. So, you know, going into a faith leader and saying, I'm here from the DB program or the SD program and you guys should have a training, it's probably not the best way to go about it because you want to just start to get to know each other. I mean, it, it is, you want it to be a relationship and a long lasting relationship. Um, I mentioned earlier that there are going to be faith leaders that you're not going to work with. There are going to be times where you have to move on because you're just not going to be able to find that common ground. Um, we also suggest that when you do start to do outreach, go for the lowest hanging fruit. Um, if you know of someone, uh, you know, maybe someone in your agency is very active in their faith community and they don't want to be the one to bring the issue to their faith community, but maybe someone else from the agency can. Or maybe you have a board member who's well connected to a, a faith community. Those are places to start. And, and you can start small, start with one, um, and then leverage that. You can ask the, as you develop the relationship, ask the clergy person or, or the faith leader, you know, lay leader in the community to make introductions for you. Um, but it does need to be a committed, ongoing um, relationship. So our last question um, before the end, which uh, is, we're wondering if you would be considering using any of the strategies um, that we've talked about here to work with your faith leaders or faith communities. And you can just type in yes or no um, 
here. We hope that there will be more yeses than noes, but if you would type that in, that would be great. Maybe they can include uh, a strategy if they want, uh, if typing it in. Maybe. <laughs> if if so, it's maybe possible in the next 30 seconds. Yeah, right, coming we in, we have um, a whole bunch of yeses. Of course, we are. Um, and things are coming, continuing to come in, and it looks like there's a lot of yeses. Um, one person said, yes, I would like to reach out to all of our local faith organizations. Another mentioned that they're scheduled to do a presentation on domestic violence and um, at from their agency at their house of worship later this month. Um, awesome. Yeah, they want to build lasting relationships with faith leaders. Um, they like the idea of speaking, um, of just speaking with the leader and talking about both um, of their goals. That's great. So I really appreciate um, everyone's responses um, and thank you um, for helping us make faith and safety an option for all faith-based victims. Um, we want to thank Colorado Costa for inviting us to present. Uh, our contact information is on the next slide. I'll show it in a second. Um, but if you have any questions or you would like some resources or you want to talk to us about technical assistance, we are funded to do all of that and we would be happy to talk to you. Um, we also have some funding to come and do some trainings across the country for this net over the next couple of years. Um, so that's always an option as well. Um, like I said, our, our contact information is right here. We welcome here. We would love to hear from you if you would like um go to our website and look at our resources if you'd like to us to send them hard copies to you we would be so happy to do that um and i guess we have some time for some questions so if if there are some additional questions please um type them in and and maria will be kind enough to read them to us Yeah, so we'll just give folks um, a little bit of time, time to type in those questions. In the meantime, thank you both so much. Um, this was very valuable information and very important. It looks like a lot of folks got, um, got a lot of really good ideas of how to move forward in working with faith leaders and um, faith-based organizations in their areas. So thank you. That's great to hear. <laughs> Feel free to, um, you can also in your evaluation, I think uh, uh, mention if you have further questions or email us at info at interfaithpartners.org if you have uh, questions that you weren't able to, or that you think of later. Great, so it looks like um, no more questions are coming in. I just, again, want to thank you all for your time, um, for putting this together and for being available for all of us. Um, any questions, again, that aren't answered or um, or that you think of after the fact, please feel free to um, to email that info, num info number, info email, um, and I'll be sending out information after immediately after. Um, that contains the copy of the, the PowerPoint, um, and then also more information on how to access this um, via web um, and our presenter's contact information. Um, a reminder, as I mentioned at the beginning, if you all could please fill out that SurveyMonkey link I will be sending here just shortly after the webinar ends. Um, we're trying something new, so hopefully it works. We want to get as much feedback as possible um, and, and really want to make sure that we're continuing to, um, to bring webinars to you all that are um, useful and important for you. Um, and just thank you all for, for being here, for attending. We hope to see you at future webinars. Thank you so much.